Um, welcome, uh, everyone. I know we're still, we've still got a few people trickling in, but we thought we would get, uh, get moving uh, for the panel this afternoon. So just so you know, you're in the right place. Um, this is the tech uh, data frontier uh, discussion. So thank you for coming, and thanks for your interest in this particular topic. Um, we're going to do this a little differently than the other panels that you've seen today. So, so bear with us. It's a little bit experimental. Um, so all the Alliance for Peace Building folks, thanks for hanging in there with, with our experiment. Uh, we're going to run this a little bit more like a talk show. Um, so we're, we're looking for uh, a lot of engagement from the audience. Um, and so instead of doing, a, you know, each panelist sort of gives a discussion, what we're going to try to do is frame out um, three different issue areas because the tech data frontier topic is pretty large. Um, so what we've, we've tried to do is to pick uh, three really relevant uh, focus areas for peace builders and uh, kind of spend a little bit, a few minutes, um, maybe 20 minutes or so on each one and encourage uh, your questions within those topic areas um, you know, as, as we move along in the discussion. Um, so without further ado, why don't I just uh, jump in. Um, I am Nancy Payne. I'm the Deputy Director for the Peace Tech Initiative here at USIP. Um, we've lost our slides, so I'm sure we'll get those back um, in just a minute. But um, we're not going to, I've got some pictures that we'll, we'll show a little bit later. So just make sure that those, oh, there we go. Um, we'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but the Peace Tech Initiative, for those of you who aren't familiar with what we do, um, we, it's a collaborative effort uh, at the intersection of technology, media, and data uh, to find effective ways of reducing violent conflict around the world. Um, so why? Why do you ask that? Um, why now? Why this? Uh, think about it really in, uh, for three reasons. Data. Um, think about the um, number uh, and amount of data that our digital devices now generate in a single year. They can do that uh, in a single year, what we've done over the course of human history. One year. Um, and it doubles every year. So our ability to collect that data also continues to grow. Um, that's a, an enormous challenge for anybody. Uh, you hear the, the term big data. It's a huge challenge, but how do we actually harness that uh, and make it useful for peace builders? Uh, mobile. Um, everybody knows uh, these things are proliferating. In Africa alone, there's about 63 mobile subscribers per 100 people. Uh, and in a lot of Arab states, a lot of Arab countries, there's 105 subscriptions per 100 per people. So you've got people actually having more than one device. Um, but how does this relate to peace building? Um, more data isn't good enough. We need different data. So my boss, the director of the Peace Tech Initiative, Sheldon Himmelfarb, who couldn't be here today, um, he often says it this way. We need data to tell us not just what is going on, but also what people think about the things that are going on. Uh, so we at USIP are actually studying this. We're looking at this um, and, and doing projects in this field. Uh, we have experts in technology, social media, data, and curriculum-based media, all working here in the building and, and also in the field. Uh, and we work closely with USAP's uh, country and regional experts on different projects aimed at using all of these different innovations in technology and media that are transforming the way that the international uh, community confronts deadly conflict and promotes security. Um, a lot of the tools uh, th that we're using are empowering people all over the world in the places that you work as well. Uh, countries like Kenya, Nigeria, Burma, Iraq, to name a few, take, uh, they're taking concrete steps toward countering violent extremism, tackling interreligious tensions, preventing election violence, and promoting local securities in, in a lot of other ways. Uh, but technologies are often created in isolated pockets with little chance of being brought to scale or applied to different conflict zones. Um, you heard Liz Schreyer earlier talking about uh, needing all of us to feel like a community. Um, we need to look at ourselves as a community, and that's really what the Peace Tech Initiative is, is also trying to advance. Um, some of you may have actually heard about the Peace Tech Lab that, uh, that our team is, is currently standing up, that USAP is supporting. Um, we've been working toward getting this lab set up and hoping to have that done within the next year. The lab is going to bring together engineers and data scientists, along with other experts, like many on this uh, panel, uh, in peace building from USIP, other government agencies, NGOs, and in the, most importantly, in the conflict zones, 
um, where, we, where we operate, to design, develop, and deploy new and existing technology tools to prevent and resolve violent international conflicts. Um, this hopefully, uh, if we're, we're working toward getting it up soon, but it should be the first facility of its kind, and it will be located here at USIP, and we're going to work in close collaboration uh, with the Institute uh, as, we, as we formulate the lab as a, as a standalone entity. Um, and we're also going to be working with uh, U.S. and international agencies to be able to bring these solutions and actually scale them up. Um, so with that, um, let me uh, introduce my panelists here, and, and we can maybe jump right into the discussion. Um, here on my left uh, is Michelle Gregory. Um, Dr. Michelle Gregory is a research scientist with, um, and she's at this, she, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read too, too, too far ahead. Um, social media and data sciences, um, and you, you are, what's, yeah, Where do I work? You're, you were at University <laughs> of Colorado, <laughs> and now I'm totally lost. You, you were at the lab, and now where are you? I work in Innovative Analytics, a small consulting firm out of DC. Innovative Analytics and Training. Um, so Michelle obviously <laughs> specializes in data science, and she also has a, a, a real focus area in social media and how that applies to the peace building field. So welcome, Michelle. Glad yes. you're here. Um, and Dr. Michael Best is joining us as well, and he is an associate professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology, um, better, better known as Georgia Tech. And um, he also, he, he's uh, kind of, a, has, a, has a foot in two fields. He's um, in the Samnon School of International Affairs, and he's also in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. So um, thank you, Michael, for coming. And uh, Michael has done a tremendous amount of work in the election violence. Uh, violence uh, space and has a lot to say on, on that topic as, as well as others. Um, we've got Noel Dickover, my colleague at the uh, Peace Tech Initiative. He's here at U U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, and Noel is a C senior program officer um, and he is really focused a lot on this uh, question of uh, big data and how do we harness it. Um, and Rachel Brown, Rachel's here. She is the CEO of Sisi Ni Niamani and um, Sisi Niamani is uh, based in Kenya. Um, and Rachel is thankfully here joining us now uh, on this side of the ocean. And uh, they have also done a lot of work. They're, they're known um, for having a group of, of local uh, Kenyan peace builders uh, and leaders and has a lot of insight on, again, election violence and, and a lot of really good stories to tell. Um, so with that, um, I want to jump in. What I'm going to do is um, pose a couple of questions and then I'm going to actually invite some questions um, from the audience. Uh, on the topic of election violence, um, elections have become a real touch point for possible violence um, and, and actual violence in a lot of countries. Um, a couple of recent examples, like Kenya's election last year and Afghanistan's um, election uh, uh, cycle now underway, showed some tentative success in, in managing this violence. Um, later this year and next year, we're going to see a lot of elections in several places that carry with it a potential for increased conflict. We've got Egypt, um, Turkey, and Ukraine coming up this year. We've got Nigeria uh, and Burma in, and others in 2015. Um, so I'm going to, going to throw this out there, Rachel and Michael, specifically to you. You both have experience in monitoring uh, elections using interesting new technologies and using mobile phones and using social media. Can you each share a little bit about your work um, in Africa and in Afghanistan and um, any insights that, that you, you want to share? I'm not Rachel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so Sisi Niamani used a variety of different tools around the elections. And um, just to give a little bit of background context in Kenya, by the time of the recent March 2013 elections, there were a lot, a lot of efforts in Kenya to monitor election-related violence and tensions. Um, probably some of you are familiar with Ushahidi. So there was an Ushahidi map um, called Uchaguzi that was being run by Ushahidi in Kenya. There was also another crowdsource, um, crowdsourcing effort and map being run by a Kenyan government institution called the National Steering Committee on Peacebuilding and Conflict Management. Again, they were collecting information and data, crowdsourced through text messages, and putting it into a map. Sisi Niamani was actually sort of complementary, in my, in my view, to these approaches in that we were not actually collecting information via SMS, we were distributing it. Um, 
we, in the run-up to the elections, and I'll talk about this a bit more later, had created a database of text message subscribers. Um, we had more than 65,000 people um, throughout the country um, in over 20 target communities that we had reached um, on our platform, and we were able to send targeted messages to different areas. And our goal was really um, to understand and interrupt communication flows that were leading to violence. So I would say our monitoring was a little bit unique in that we weren't looking for verified factual early warning. These people are moving from here to there, and they're armed, and they might be ready to attack. If we heard that that was happening, and we verified that it wasn't true, but that the rumor existed, our goal was still to interrupt that information flow, because what we understood was that even things that weren't factually correct, even communications that had no basis in reality had the potential to influence reality. A rumor is a very potent thing, and it can really, um, rumors can often be self-fulfilling, and uh, they can cause conflicts in different ways than what they're originally predicting. So our goal was to really look at how um, different behavior chains and information flows that could lead all the way from a rumor being started up until someone decided to take action and arm themselves and participate in violent conflict about that information or perception of conflict or um, electoral rigging or any other event. So when we were monitoring the situation, we were monitoring a whole host of factors, including sort of the mood on the ground, the types of information and rumors that were going around, as well as what was actually happening. Um, so our response was very technology-based in that we were sending these mass, uh, mass text messages that were targeted um, to different parts of our subscriber base. But the monitoring was really simple. Um, it used phones, but it was actually a trusted network of partners um, that we had worked with, 20 to 30 people in each of our target areas who we would talked with about these information flows to conflict and who would alert us of any issues. And then we had a team of about 10 coordinators, um, I'm sorry, 20 coordinators, verifying that information um, by calling around to the different partners in the area, um, reporting it to a central location, and initiating a message. So we were using technology, and this is something that's important to me. The crowdsourcing efforts, um, they brought, um, I think they have a lot to offer, and they can really target the masses. But our purpose was to have a specific type of response, and we built a monitoring system for ourselves that was really geared towards verifying what we needed, knowing what we needed to specifically have that response. And because of that, our monitoring system itself, while it did use phones to communicate over broad geographic areas, it wasn't so technology-based as it was people-based. Yeah, thank you, Nancy and, and Rachel. And um, I think that it's really important what Rachel was mentioning because uh, we too look to bridge these gaps from data to knowledge through analysis to action through uh, uh, engagement. And I think it's that last step, the knowledge to action leap, that I would like to mm -hmm. interrogate maybe even as the panel mm -hmm. goes forward. In 2011, my lab at Georgia Tech, the Technologies and International Development Lab, partnered with a group of youth activists called Enough is Enough in Nigeria. Uh, Enough is Enough is a consortium of youth activists. They call themselves the Facebook generation of Nigeria. They're young, they're networked enabled, and they're a little bit pissed off and they want change. And we partnered with them to develop a system and system of processes to monitor the 2011 election and respond or act upon actionable um, information that we uh, picked up across the social media. Um, we built, um, uh, collaborating with the Consortium of Youth Activists and my lab, which is made up of political scientists, computer scientists, visual designers, and lawyers, a software technology and process called Aggie the Social Media Aggregator. Um, this technology vacuums up across multiple social media platforms, everything from Facebook to Twitter to Ushahidi instances to blogs to anything you can syndicate over RSS. 
Um, during the uh, Nigerian election, we, uh, which was a three-week election, we brought together about a half a million different reports across these various social media platforms and were able in real time to provide some analysis and response not dissimilar to the type of workflow that Rachel described. We went through processes of relevance testing to reports as they were coming in in real time to then verifiability to then actionability. In one particular instance, some of you may know in the April presidential election in Nigeria in that year, um, violence uh, uh, outbreak broke in the north of the country in particular as the opposition party candidate um, called into question the early results putting good luck Jonathan back in the presidency uh, um, during the election. Um, thousands of people were killed. The country truly was on the brink. And so we quickly were able, in this instance, to reconfigure the searches and queries that the Aggie system was performing in real time to focus not just on electoral irregularities, which had been what primarily we had been looking at, say, for instance, a polling place that had run out of ballot papers, but instead to focus on these acts of violence and potential acts of violence occurring primarily in the North. In one, um, I think, you know, useful uh, anecdote, though not to be taken too far, we uh, picked up tweets that were coming from a pair of sister students at a polytechnic in Kano, a major city in the north. They were tweeting about mobs amassing around their particular dormitory. We had an embed as part of our escalation process at the National Security Coordination Facility in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. After testing for relevance, verifying or veracity, and actionability, we then escalated this particular series of tweets to the security um, um, center in Abuja who dispatched law enforcement and troops and were able to secure the safe uh, passage of these two students. Coming new for 2014, and I'll foreshadow this a little bit, but perhaps return to it later, we're beginning to look at new ways to link a broader set of data inputs into this process of data to knowledge to action. And in particular, what we're integrating is formal observer data based upon a parallel set of projects coming out of my lab, working in collaboration with the Carter Center to develop uh, uh, appliances and software for, uh, for mobile handsets and for tablets that uh, en enable their uh, formal trained observers to obtain election-based knowledge. So we're now going to deploy next month at the Akiti state election and then in 2015 February for the national election again in Nigeria, uh, a technology that will integrate across social media, integrate, uh, bringing in and aggregating in addition the formal observer data coming off of the ELMO technology. Excellent. You know, it's interesting, you talk about the verification process and each of you took a little bit of a different, um, you know, have a different take on it. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, you, you know, if you if you would sort of advocate for one method or another. I think, Rachel, you, you made the comment about verification and not, you know, not being able to necessarily verify everything, but, but also being able to counter rumors um, and, and the importance of doing that. Um, whereas, Michael, I think you're taking a little bit of a, to, to be able to go in and actually try to um, stop very specific actions. Um, I don't know if you, you know, if you want to talk a little bit more about um, how the verification process works um, and, and maybe what is on the horizon on that front um, for this, this upcoming election cycle. Uh, really quickly, the, the verification we use mostly is twofold. Uh, One is triangulation across multiple sources or media types. And the second is what we would call out-of-band verification, meaning 
um, verification via our own partners who might be on the ground in the right location or by retweeting back to the tweeters and saying, is this really going on? Can you provide some more data? That kind of thing. But I think Rachel's point where it's not just if it's true, but if it's something that could influence is a, uh, is a very important insight. And, um, and there's nothing, I would say, particular to our processes or workflow that would, would disallow for that kind of important addition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would definitely say, I mean, we were verifying to find out if things were true. So if we did find out that something was happening, we had a different type of response, including a message and usually contacting relevant responders. But I think my point was more that um, we also cared if it was just true that something was being talked about. And I think what this really gets at is um, designing monitoring based on programmatic goals. Um, and so I think what was important, what worked for CC Niamani, our goal was to be able to send messages um, and interrupt flows of information that could contribute to violence. And because of those goals, we knew we'd also find out about information that could be acted on and responded to in other ways. And we did set up structures to do that. But our entire monitoring effort was created to enable us to fulfill that goal. Um, and I think there's different purposes to different programs, so I would think that probably different monitoring approaches can be taken um, depending on, we also had a, we had a big subscriber base. We had 65,000 people and made a, con a conscious decision not to ask them to report, message, to report information via SMS, via text message, because we knew that we didn't have the capacity to deal with that huge amount of information. Um, so we also made decisions based on what was our capacity to filter information and respond to it. And we thought that um, our best chance at really being able to take action on the issues we were finding out about and to find out about the issues that mattered in our target locations was to train and work with um, about 20 people in each area where we were working. Um, but then I think there's different value to different approaches. Um, the approach that Michael was taking um, was looking at a much huger data set and obviously the verification procedures for that is gonna look a lot different because he's also not working with pre-vetted um, people, for example, on Twitter or Facebook where they're collecting the data. And the people that we were working with, we pre-vetted them, so we just had to make a couple calls to see how far a rumor had spread or if someone had witnessed it firsthand. Um, I'm gonna turn to the audience and, and ask, have um, audience questions. I see somebody right here um, in the middle. We've got one here and then we've got another. Uh, we've got three, so why don't we take these three and then if there's more. Um, why don't we start with the, the woman here in the middle and then We'll go from there. Okay, that's you're great. Go, <laughs> go for it. And then I'll take yours, and we'll 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 try and answer them in a row. So I think it's it's so cool because you're working in very very real time and responsive. One of the things that. Um, and, and I don't do this work myself, but I have friends that are doing it with the Defense Department, and especially around disaster response. Just wondering, because um, one of the struggles is the effects of time. So you know, you get something that comes up, you know, and then how do you do? You have like algorithms, or have you kind of come up with some best practices for you know this road is blocked? Well, ten days later, it may not still be blocked. Well, so how do you start to you know change the storyline? Because otherwise, you just get a map full of things that or you know, a, 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 an information space that's full of stuff that hasn't been able to accommodate the time thing, so. Great, um, I've got somebody in the middle here too. And then we'll just, we'll take them one by one. Thank go ahead. Thank you, hi, Jessica Murray with Search for Common Ground. So I have a question um, for Rachel. How did you get the 65 subscribers and how early did you start um, kind of campaigning to get those subscribers? Okay, and I think there was one more here on the side. So, so I like what I like about these these stories is it's beginning to close the classic gap between early warning and early response. But I, I still don't quite hear what the early response mechanism side of the thing is. Um, you talk about actionable information, but then who is in place to actually take the action? So have you preset, I mean, you have local organizations, local partners, and some of them might be in a position to do something, whatever that is. Um, but in, in at least one case, Rachel, you, you actually were sending, um, you're getting police to, to come in. Are they pre, um, 
you know, have you had a relationship or communication with them ahead of time to know that you may be getting information and you may be passing it on to them? I know that in some places people are setting up, you know, various forms of local peace committees, whatever, who are preset to to be able to take this stuff on. So connecting that the information that you're talking about, the information flows to those those response mechanisms at the other at the other end, um, and then what are the variety of responses that they might be able to undertake, and have, have you know, is there some um, uh, sort of protocol that decides well what is the appropriate action? Okay, thank you. Why don't we start, um, why don't we just go in line here. Um, I think w what I heard is the, the challenge of, um, on the effects of time, uh, what are some practices for dealing with real-time data versus data that is minutes or hours or days old? Um, can, can we just <clears throat> looking at humanitarian assistance disaster response, that, that whole field did this, this dramatic change in innovation with the Haiti disaster. You had most of the, the formal response mechanisms incapacitated. So there is both this need and opportunity for, for all sorts of different approaches. And, and the problem there, as you probably know, is how do you get to valid information? And most now recognize the first week of a disaster, you don't have your assessment teams on the ground. You're not going to get it. And really, the best you're going to find is social media and mobile data. And so the change happened that, that you know, previous to that, you still had formal, you know, crisis response organizations waiting for their assessment teams to, to, to make findings, but that just, it couldn't happen there. So you now have a very different way where um, UNOCHA even has, you know, there's this digital humanitarian network where volunteers around the world, they did things in Haiti like actually map Port-au-Prince and the Haitian diaspora translated messages from mobile, and there's this whole process that was called Mission 4636 that got into it. But the bottom line, that field has really evolved in three or four years. The, the peace building field is, is almost like a before Haiti time. I mean, both of these instances are amazing things happening. There's not a lot of them. It's, it's a relatively new thing to think through how peace building and technology work. And, and most peace builders, aren't really tech savvy, right? And most civil society participants across the world aren't very tech savvy. So there's there's this, you know, almost cultural change that peace builders have to do to, to apply to that. But thinking through real-time data in a peace building context, we're experimenting now. I mean, we, we have some ideas, but I think if you, you talk to the HADDR folks, they're gonna have a, a much better idea now how it works than say three years ago. Um, yeah. Right. So, so, yeah, so I would add to that, um, there, there is a very large effort in algorithm development, but looking in social media in particular on, on the issue of we, we do have upcoming elections, so it's not just monitoring in real time, it's how much can we figure out beforehand, what can our algorithms predict that's going to happen. And then you can have a very good baseline and have a better place to shift from. Um, and then your algorithms can work in real time to update that information. Um, so there is quite a bit of research in this area, uh, and you'll hear me talk about it later today as well, but there's definitely um, lots of algorithms for determining real time. The geolocation is a huge part of that, determining that um, in real time as well, and getting that information out to people who need it. Um, I'm going to hop to the last question, and then we'll come back to, to the Rachel question, and that was um, because I think that there is a little bit here um, related to uh, early response. And I think that's a really key question because if you all know uh, better than anyone that early response is, you know, it continues to be a challenge, um, especially around uh, election violence. So, you know, are we closing the gap? Um, and the question was, who's in a position to take action, and what are response protocols? Michael, do you do you want to jump sure. in? Sure. So, um, trying to answer both of them a little bit at, at the same time, um, we also are very much engaged in this algorithms for immediate uh, response. We work on two time frames, micro and kind of macro. So we're doing things in real time. Um, receiving quite a lot of data, so in a normal election we might be receiving 50 reports a second, and um, uh, we're prepared to scale that to 1,000 a second, I think, right now. 
And we have algorithms to try to make sense of that, both human and computer-based. And then our response uh, algorithm, both human and computer-based, really is based on these embeds. And the way it's been um, it done so far in our interventions so far, which are, are, have been in Ghana, Nigeria, and Liberia, all three countries, we've had our own team members in the National Security Coordination Facility, in the National Election Center, the com Independent Commission, in uh, the traditional media center, so all these places have had a place where broadcast media uh, folks are at, and print media, and in the coordination center amongst the international observer missions and sometimes domestic observer missions. So we've had our people in those three countries successfully embedded in those places, and then if it's a security issue, we go to our embed who has relationships in the security coordination place. If it's a, you know, the polling places has a, a logistical problem, we go to the electoral commission where we have a relationship. I'll add, we were at the Kenya election, and we failed to establish relationships with, in particular, the government actors who were not interested in the relationship, and so we were not able to escalate uh, through to a security response or to the Electoral Commission. So it, it requires the government buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, and I can share a little bit of our experience, which I think, um, if I back up a little bit about the sort of goal and purpose of CC Amani. Our goal was to support local peace groups and peace actors on the ground to better use strategic communication, including new types of technology. So that's where our SMS platform came in. Um, we weren't set up as a monitoring organization. And so like I said, our monitoring efforts were all based at being able to support local peace builders to have this informational response to send messages. Um, so before the election, we spent a lot of time preparing ourselves for that response. Um, and I think probably I'll talk about this a little bit under the social media mm -hmm. side of things, but actually some of it connects to the panel that we did that we just heard from previously on marketing peace. Um, we actually had someone from the marketing industry, from Ogilvy and Mather, come work with us for two weeks pro bono. Um, we had laid out different situations that we could predict might happen, different types of situations that would lead to violence, and done co-creation workshops where we invited uh, members of different target demographic groups. Um, this included young unemployed men or men who had participated in violence before, but it also included a category of people we called information spreaders. So this was people selling things by the side of the road or in the transport industry who we know had a really big role to play in the spread of rumors and information in their community. So with each one of these groups, we walked them through the situations that could lead to conflict and had them create messages they would send to a peer with a specific behavior change goal. So one goal might be stop a rumor from spreading. We want this person to decide either not to spread the rumor or just to ask a couple questions about where is this rumor coming from and interrogate it. Um, another specific behavior change goal might be a lot of situations would happen, especially in urban um, informal settlements, where people said, you can tell that there's violence. Young men start grouping um, and talking with each other, and the conversations get defensive, and they start making plans. So when, when we were monitoring, we were monitoring for things as specific as young men are starting to group and talk about potential rigging. And our message that we would send then was a message that had been created specifically to encourage people to go home. Um, we did a lot of work on risk mitigation so that these messages wouldn't be alarmist, mm -hmm. but our preparation for response was a lot about creating messages, um, message templates that would be appropriate for specific situations, as well as message guidelines and some understandings of our audience. Part of what we pulled out from these workshops was what were incentives for people on the ground? What did we need to remind them of to change their mind? It wasn't usually be peaceful. It was usually something like, if we're violent, we're not gonna be able to run our businesses and make money. Um, so it was really pulling out these learnings and being ready to respond on that front. And I will say, um, Kenya was a little bit unique. In our experience, I think um, we were there for a really long time, since 2010, and we did develop relationships with a lot of government responders. And Kenya actually had one government institution that was supposed to be responsible for coordinating all the responses to electoral um, tensions. So we were really escalating to them, and we did wish that there was a network of local mediators we could escalate to for sort of an in-between response. Um, but yeah, I, one last thing. I know I've been talking for a little while, but I do think in terms of closing that early warning, early response gap, 
I think that there's maybe a need to not design those two things so separately. Um, I think when you design early warning over here and you design early response over here and you try and bridge the gap, um, especially at a large scale, it gets messy and confusing and really hard to coordinate. And I think the two need to be designed more closely together, not just designed as totally separate entities. Did you answer the question, the last question about the subscribers? How, how did, did you get to how did I, <laughs> yeah. um, So we worked on that for a really long time. We um, started piloting an approach where people would subscribe um, in late 2010 and adapted our mobile technology and experimented with different types of subscription. At first, people signed up on paper, and then we developed the technology further so people could sign up by phone. Um, so really, we started as early as early 2011 doing major subscription. Um, we did our biggest subscription drive actually um, in the months before the election, just because that's when we got financial support to do it. Um, <laughs> and we subscribed. That was about 30,000 people that we subscribed in the three months before the election. Until then, we'd sort of been bootstrapping along. But I do think it was really important that we were in the community and developing relationships all along. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, it was important that we weren't just coming in for the election. And because our goal was really response and having a relationship and influencing the community, having done that work for the years prior and built relationships is what let us get information about exactly what was going on. Um, it's what let our partners trust us and what made community members, I think, more responsive to getting messages from our organization because they were familiar with us. Um, and again, back to the former panel, that was the messenger, right? We spent a lot of time building our brand and um, getting people to know and trust us in the community. Um, and outreach, it was door to door. It was local peace groups going door to door subscribing there's people. <laughs> How do I advance this? There we go. Um, there's, a, there's just a few pictures here, I think, of Rachel's uh, colleagues in Kenya and, and talking, illustrating, I think, some of the work that, the great work that she's done. Um, I think we can move on um, to the social media topic. So this is this is great, and I think this kind of morphs right into um, the the picture showing That's here nice. uh, and and what a revolutionary tool uh, social media uh, has has known to to be um, has has really evolved into. Um, it has become an, a tool for activists and and journalists and citizens trying to get news out uh, or get news in. Uh, about different revolutions and, and different things happening in, in conflict areas. So, um, you know, in many ways, it's also become a tool for uh, or organizing and engagement. Um, you know, we, we heard, again, from the previous panel about, uh, the, you know, the viral videos and, and how that's a tool for raising awareness uh, and delivering a message. Um, I'm hoping that all of you can give some specific examples of how social media is actually now being applied to the peace building field. So I think, why don't we start with Michelle and share a little bit about that. OK, so um, social media and for peace building is used really in three ways. Um, the first is uh, how, how these two are talking about it, where you have a real time situation and you're organizing online. Um, this is also true, um, the recent case in um, Brazil, where protests were organized on Facebook, crowdsourcing, we all know it, um, a flash mob is, uh, and so those techniques can be used uh, by local peace builders to, to quickly organize. Um, the, another way, that's, that's the local real time, uh, another major way that social media has been used for peacekeeping is in informing the international community. And I would put um, monitoring political uh, elections in this category. Uh, we all know about the Arab Spring. That would be in this category. Um, there have actually been instances where um, uh, you can find locals who will be uh, interacting on Facebook, say, in their local language, and say, hey, we need to get on Twitter and start using English so we get more attention from the Western world. There's um, lots of documented cases of that. Um, <clears throat> Then there's, uh, I think, a major way that it's used, in, and especially in academia, is post-conflict analysis. Um, and in fact, we learned from post-conflict analysis, and this was, I think, uh, a USIP uh, study in 2010 um, done with Bitly, that, that it turned out that it wasn't so much um, in the Arab Spring that people were organizing themselves. It was mostly used uh, as um, 
as an information place to go for the international community. It was mostly used by the international community, not so much the locals to organize. Um, so those are, I think, the three major ways that social media is used in peace building. And all of those different techniques um, require different questions and different tools that you have to use and different capabilities um, to be able to accomplish those. Anybody else want to take that? Really interesting example of one of uh, use of social media recently in Burma. Uh, anybody heard of the Panzigar movement? So Nafon Lot, who's a um, an activist from the Saffron Revolution, he's started this ICT uh, organization there called Mido. Uh, in April, they had their their water festival, which is you know associated with the New Year. And he did a really interesting example of sort of online organizing to offline action, right? Which is where you see a lot of these. I mean, social media, you know, collectivism isn't, isn't gonna make a difference, but if, if you're able to do coalition building online that, that leads to offline action, it's a, it's a really powerful approach. And the neat thing there, I mean, Facebook in Burma right now is, is pretty much what AOL was in the 90s here, right? I mean, that is, the internet for the very small select group that have it. And if you're using Facebook in Burma and contacting somebody, chances are you're contacting somebody in a city. But they, they did this, this, this effort on Facebook that led to people offline putting flowers in their mouth and going to public places, posting posters. One of the real challenges there is, is some of the hate speech is driven by Buddhist monks. And their place in society is not such that you can challenge them directly. So. This, this flower power approach of putting these flowers, you know, and sharing this, these pictures and, and broadcasting it wasn't a direct, you know, response to the hate speech as much as it was do this instead, right? And, and that's a really interesting campaign. It's a positive campaign, and, and it, it seemed to have, you know, it certainly got a lot of buzz. I haven't seen, you know, the, the, the impact of it yet, but in a place where only 7% of the folks are online. Uh, that's, I thought, was a really great way to get the youth to take that and then to start having offline action that you know is gonna show up where the bus stations are and so forth. So that's, that's from April. I thought it was a great example. And just sort of to ride on that point of online to offline action, I think that's something really important to remember is that um, Social media impacts how fast we get information from how many people, how much information we're able to get. And it really influences people's perceptions and behavior. Um, but it's only powerful insofar as it's actually influencing people, right? It's not the tools or the social media in and of itself. It's, is it actually having an impact on people and on society? Is it translating into something offline? as well? Is it changing social norms? Is it changing the way people are acting? And I think this is one really big challenge for the peace building world in terms of specifically um, using social media to counter um, calls to violence and speech leaning towards violence. And, and one thing I, I also want to point out is that um, this isn't just an opportunity for actors in the peace building world. The opening up of social media and different mediums of communication is also an opening for anyone who wants to incite violence to do so really effectively. Um, the reason Sisi Niamani chose to use mobile phones in Kenya is that we saw in 2007 and in 2008 during the post-election violence, violent actors used mobile phones really effectively and they influenced a lot of people really quickly across geographical areas. Um, in Myanmar, that's Facebook. In other areas, that's Twitter. Um, it's not always one medium, but when there are these mediums available to influence a lot of people really quickly, violent actors are taking advantage of them, and they are at an advantage because usually someone who's trying to influence people towards violence has a very clear action. We talked about this earlier, right? Do we have something concrete that we're trying to sell? I think the peace message often gets lost because what does it mean, be peaceful? A lot of people take that to mean do nothing, right? The um, flower talk example is something where people could take an action to symbolize what they were standing for. Having really clear goals of what we want people to do is going to be more and more important because violent actors also have a bigger, more influential arena where they can be calling people to action. I think that's right. Um, I actually think, as social media relates to peace and conflict, that it is Janus-faced. That, on the one hand, it can be used as a tool for peace building, but on the other hand, it can be seized as a tool to uh, enable conflict. 
What I, you know, and, and this morning, I mean, today at lunch, uh, Ms. Marx said it's not about the technology, it's about transformation. And, you know, I believe that, but as a technology, I guess I want, technologist, I guess I want to shamelessly have it both ways and really think about how to architect social media to privilege peace building and to detract opportunities for conflict. And so here's a modest result that might suggest these kinds of architectures for peace. Uh, in our analysis, post hoc, as we're talking about the temporal issues, the macro anal analysis, uh, across African election data, we find that some social medias seem better for the peaceful resp rapid response. Now, social medias in general are architected for connection and for disclosure. You connect, say on Facebook, by forming your group of friends, their intimates and quasi-intimates, and then you disclose to them. For instance, I had the turkey sandwich for lunch. <laughs> These architectures can select between connection and disclosure. And what we find in the African context is that the selection more for disclosure, which we find in Twitter, than for connection amongst intimates, which we find in Facebook, may support peace building. And I say it's modest and may because these, I don't think we should run off and, and we shouldn't overlearn this result that we all want to support Twitter or we all want to support disclosure over connection. But what it does, I think, point to is a real deep engineering and human question, which is what are the technologies or architectures for social media that we want, not what we're given, mm -hmm. not what especially uh, very large corporate interests are giving us, like a Facebook or a Twitter. What are we wanting and then how do we architect them, designing the social media platforms to allow us to privilege peace building over conflict? So I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a second here. We have to, maybe we all don't remember, but some of us remember that Facebook actually didn't start as a big corporation <laughs> worth billions of dollars, right? It started in a dorm room. And, and in fact, there's a lot, of, a lot of the social media that's out there. How it takes hold is because it's inherently a social device. Um, and, and we've seen that in China with the advent of Tencent. This was... Um, a bit like Snapchat, but the government's monitoring um, Sino Weibo, and so it was the actual users that came up with this new platform. Here's the way we can get by the government monitoring, right? And so these technologies inherently, we all know Twitter now is huge, um, but there will constantly be new platforms that people can, because they're really, they're really individual driven, which is really ha has been the power of Web 2.0 technologies, is that they really start at the localized level. Um, for use. So we don't have to pick what's out there, right? We can also sort of um, go with what's organic, sort of like choosing SMS um, in the Kenya example, because that is what people use. And in Pakistan, it's a combination of SMS and Twitter. So there's also a corollary in there from the HADR space where there's now a recognition that, that people in the affected crisis zone aren't just victims. They are truly the first responders. And to the extent that you can empower them with better situational awareness of their environment and actions that they can take, they can really make a difference. And I gotta think there's a corollary in the peace building space. The real peace builders are not people in this room, right? It's, it's people in the conflict zones. And so how, you know, like Rachel's approach there of getting 20 people in each of these areas, those are the peace builders. So social media enables that process, but, but it's not magical, it's hard work, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of things you need to do to make it successful, but we see that this is possible. And it's, it's again, it's in a time of experimentation to see really how far that, that approach can go. Uh, one thing to add on that actually, um, that I think is interesting talking about how we can support local peace builders. One sort of unexpected, and I'll put this out as a hesitant result too, because it's mostly anecdotal, um, that we saw from our work is that, um, Violence tends to be really visible because 
if there's violence going on, you see it, right? There can be five people running around in a community wreaking havoc and people feel unsafe, even if the majority of people want to be peaceful. And often in situations where there's violence, I think we all realize that it's not an easy choice between peace and conflict. It's often people at huge risk. Um, you're up against people really being afraid for their lives, for their families' lives, and making decisions based on that. And often peace looks pretty invisible. And what we saw from sending messages, because we had several thousand subscribers in each community, and because we'd worked with these different um, peace groups to go out with these branded t-shirts and messaging into the area, they were telling us that essentially peace b began to look more visible. So some of the subscriber feedback we got when we called people and, it, um, and surveyed them was that they felt safer getting the messages and just knowing that there was someone looking out um, about violence in their community. Or that getting a message, gave, a lot of people said the message gave me the courage to preach peace in my community. So um, I do think social media can also increase the visibility of peace, which is often seen as the absence of something. It can really create an identity that people can latch onto. But we have to also be really smart and strategic about how we're doing that. And in turn, that identity can give credibility and courage to people on the ground who want to speak up. Um, do we have questions? Anybody on this particular topic? All right, well, I'll ask a couple. Oh, we've got one right here. Did you, okay. No, no, please, go ahead. This is a, it's a, this collab is interactive. It's a collaborative ahead. effort. It's a collaborative effort. <clears throat> you should be tweeting live. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Um, um, I'm Doris Mariani. I'm CEO of Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, we've got about 225 people on the ground in places like South Sudan, Myanmar, and the Philippines. And um, in the Philippines, the early warning, early response mechanism has been very important to us. Um, and, and I stress the response part because this came up. And we're now trying to figure out um, how to make it better now that the peace agreement has been signed by the MILF and the government. The new Bangsamoro substate that is going to be established is going to need a statewide early warning, early response system. And, and we just recently learned what, what you Shahidi means, and you know, <laughs> we don't have a lot of tech people. So I'm, I'm most curious to hear from you uh, where does one start this process? Uh, um, I mean, we can articulate maybe what we would like to see, but the journey from here to where we want to be is uh, where, where you all live. And, and, and then um, the other thing, uh, what we don't do is we don't name and shame. So, so the disclosure part, as you put it, is I mean, whatever whatever information we report, first of all, gets verified, and the idea is the reduction of violence to create a more peaceful world. But but how does what one go on that journey, if if one wants to serve the communities and keep one's staff safe, mm -hmm. uh, and use harness technology? That's an excellent question, and it definitely I think the safety question is definitely is one that you have faced in the past, but it's one that I think every day we, we do have to think about. So mm -hmm. does, does anybody want to jump on the, where do you start the process and then talk about safety? I, I can. No. So, so the part about learning the technologies, right, this is, this is a real challenge. And, and there's sort of two levels to it. Uh, I spent the last three years of my life connecting local technologists with local civil society folks, first at the State Department, and, and now here we've, we've done a series of three of these in Iraq uh, around anti-corruption. It turns out the real innovation in most developing countries is with the local tech community, especially if the local tech community is tied to the open source movement. Uh, in most places I've been to, and, and Michael offers me a counterexample, so I'm not gonna say all, uh, the open source community has some real power. It's, it's, it's really based on a meritocracy in a lot of ways. And if you're in a country that has endemic corruption, you're really not exposed to, to meritocracies is, is a normal thing, but getting tied into the open source community, it has these ways of local meetings called bar camps and hackathons, and, and you develop some level of trust relatively quickly and you do it over time. And, and they start to know each other and they innovate. 
What doesn't always happen is this connection to social good. But it turns out technologists in developing countries love doing social good projects just as much as they do in New York or Paris or anywhere else. So <clears throat> sort of a first order would be if you can connect the folks you're working with with the local technologists in the Philippines, they're going to be able to tell you what technologies work, what services are available on the SMS gateway, uh, and come up with innovative solutions to do what you need. You need to come up with a format that works for that. Uh, I developed this at the State Department called Tech Camps. We now have them here called Peace Tech Exchanges, and we've done this really nice back-end thing. But the idea is to come up with this two-day, very interactive, small group discussion format where you bring these two groups together, more peace builders than technologists so you don't get conversations about Ruby on Rails and you know Linux and so forth, but it's really about <laughs> the issues that you have. But, but there's a process for doing that that's, that's, you know, it's online and it's shareable, although there's, there's still you know, a lot of work putting it in practice. But bringing those two groups together, that's going to give you a level of innovation you're just not going to find in the peace building uh, field. The other step is for, for us in what I would refer to as this nascent peace tech community to start laying out online some of the resources. So, you know, what is this crowdsourcing thing? And I now hear about crowd seeding, where I actually, you know, pay people to give me specific results or event reporting platforms. What does that mean? I mean, there's a lot of these. In the challenges, they rapidly change. That's critically problematic for security, right? So if Skype is safe today in some places or not, what is it going to be in three months from now when something, you know, when Microsoft bought it, what was the implications, right? Uh, who owns your telecom? Who owns your ISP? You know, these are all questions that, that the local tech community is going to have some level of knowledge at. And if you could find the security person in that country or set of them, they're going to be very helpful in answering that question for, you know, what can you do? How can you interact safely online? There, there are also other inherent risks. Um, you know, whatever you can do as a peace builder in a peace building network and community, um, the opposition can do as well. And whatever you can see, they can see. Um, and there are obviously, I mean, we've all heard of very real examples. Um, one of these was last December, um, where the Syrian opposition um, was in, their Twitter network was infiltrated by um, government supporters who were able to download some um, malware. Then the government then could recognize through this malware who was part of the opposition. Um, and that's always going to be a problem. And the technology does change quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in cybersecurity, this is, you know, it's always the race we have. As soon as you can patch something up, you've got the other side right. with just as good technological skills. Um, getting around that patch. So uh, something to be aware of. There's also the geolocation is great, um, but you can be geolocated then. So it's sort of really understanding how the technologies work and what they do and, and what information is out there is really important to keep people safe. And I, I would add to that also, I think people, because these things are relatively new and they're changing all the time, I think um, someone who decides to go to a rally, they understand what the risks are. It's a normal mm -hmm. behavior. and the risks and benefits are pretty clear to them. Um, people don't always know if they're texting into a crowdsourcing platform what the risk is. And I think that there becomes a really big responsibility to make sure that anyone who's participating understands the risks, um, not through some legalese agreement that they clicked when they agreed to have a Facebook account or something like that, but really understands what are the potential risks and can make that decision for themselves. Um, because people in conflict situations do decide to put themselves at risk, um, and they decide what degree of risk they're comfortable with. And I think what the thing that we can really do is make sure that people understand exactly how much risk they're exposing themselves to. Um, two other quick things I would say on the community side would be, one, um, I think it's really helpful to observe what are people already doing? What technology are people using? What's normal for them? What's comfortable? And building onto existing behavior. So not setting up a platform that's totally different from the way people are interacting or calling their aunt or uncle or brother or sister to say this is going on. Right? How do you build into existing behaviors? Because I think that's much more likely to be successful. Um, and again, I would say almost designing response-based monitoring. So knowing these are the types of response options we have, and as we get information in, our goal is to filter it towards one of these responses, right? So really looking, I would suggest working both ways, looking at monitoring to response, but also looking at possible responses and how would you get the information you needed to have them. I think we've got 
question down here? Kristen? <laughs> I think we need the mic for, that's all right. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen Lord, USIP. I'm, the panel is making me think back on a comment I once heard from a really brilliant engineer at InQtel, and he told me uh, that when you're trying to use technology to address a problem, more than half the issue is not the technology, but surfacing the problem and articulating the problems in ways that technologists can then address. You're all yes. nodding. Okay, this is very good. <laughs> um, but uh, th so the question I have for you all is, how good a job is the peace building community doing at surfacing the right problems and then articulating them in a way that the te technologists can address. And if we're not doing a good enough job, how do we get better? So this Excellent is question. what I spend my days doing <laughs> um, in, in peace building communities and other government communities. Uh, there is this real um, lack of understanding between technology providers, e even when they're being paid by the source to build the technology and the people using it. Um, and, and it really takes someone who can bridge b all of that. Um, as peace builders, you're not you're trained in languages, you're trained in political science, um, you're not trained in technology and XML and JSON formats and what it means um, if you estimate geolocation versus um, have actual geolocation. You, you know that's that's not your job, and it shouldn't be. At the same time, you have the technology providers thinking we know how to do this, we can do this, but they really don't understand those questions. Um, and, and you need to find people or hire people that, that can really bridge that gap. Um, I, I can tell you so many instances of, um, of clients thinking they have some technology and t it turns out they don't. They, they thought they were paying for it, but the technologists are like, oh no, that's our special sauce. <laughs> of course we don't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, and uh, the funniest quote I have from, from one of the peace builders is, you know, it's that's fine if you're building toothpaste to make that decision, but uh, we're talking about people's lives here, <laughs> right? So, so we need to know exactly what's in the data, not your version of what's in the data, um, and that that is a gap that is getting better with the younger generation as, as uh, people are just more tech savvy coming out of high school and college, um, but it's it's really understanding those questions and what it's not just the technology, but it's also the data that would actually answer that. So, Do you want to go? Okay, go ahead. So, so the Peace Tech Exchange is, is is really geared towards answering that exact question, and it, and it is, to me, a combination of both bringing international technologists to fill gaps that maybe aren't local, but but having the local technologists who may not under, understand the peace building world at all, but I I almost have to take as a given, and sometimes this isn't true, but that the peace builders should understand their world and what they're trying to get accomplished, and if they do you have this nice overlapping Venn diagram and, and sort of the progression of the day is to expose people through you know, this fire hose approach of brief technologies, then give them a deep dive in an area, then to completely step back and talk about the problems and challenges of say corruption in Iraq, independent of that, and then to do this connection at the end of the day. And what we're trying to do is come up with an engagement point that, that, that technologists can work on but that totally describes, you know, the problem that that uh, uh, you know the, the civil society folks are having. Like a good example that comes to mind, we did uh, one of these when I was at the State Department in Romania with the Roma population there. And one of the problems that came out is how can we improve the image of the Roma in the the media, including new media, right? That's because they're seen as thieves and gypsies and all that. A technologist can look at that and say, oh yeah, digital storytelling. That'll work for that. Or we can do a blog-based approach to start gathering videos. I mean, there's like probably five or six or seven different options that a technologist could pose for them. And so the idea on the second day is a, a selection of problems to work on. And the first day, the technologists are leading all the sessions, and the NGOs figure out where they want to go. The second day, the NGOs take the lead, and the technologists go to the problems that they think they're best able to solve. So to me, it really is, you've got to connect these two communities, and, and that's the best way you're going to sort of come up with those innovations. And I do think it's a key question um, that is posed, and that is, um, you know, are, 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 the, is the peace builder, are the peace builders actually framing it the right way? Um, but it really goes back to what Rachel said earlier, which is you've got to, you know, you've got to design an, um, a program based on very specific 
uh, goals and objectives. And, and you've got to start with what the goal is, and you've got to start with the audience and who the, the end beneficiary is, and you've got to start with the people aspect and not the technology aspect. So I think that's, awesome. you know, that, that's really what we all need to keep in mind, because you can get a little bit carried away with the, the ne next you know, whiz-bang technology. I do have to jump in. Uh, yep. And then we're going to move on to the next topic, if, if, <laughs> real quick. John, when he mentioned the sort of the overemphasis on metrics and evaluation, technology is something that, that really is about rapid experimentation. You can't stick your metrics in place for a project you're going to do eight months from now and expect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you're going to need to learn to fail, to modify, to change. It's, it's rapid experimentation that works with technology. It's not. Yeah. Let me plan it ahead of time, and that's the process I'm going to okay. stay with because, gosh, that's what my funder told me to do. True. I mean, that just doesn't work in but that it, field. It's a, it's a healthy tension that we, yeah. we have to live with every day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Michelle, I was just going to connect Michael. these two actual interventions because in some ways it's about how the civil society connects to the technology and then the specifics of peace building connecting to technology. And I work on this problem every day. In fact, I would say it's the thing I spend most of my time on is how do these... Uh, communities connect, and it's because obviously, as we I think have been hearing, the civil society group or the peace building community own the problems and the context, um, but they also are laboring routinely under a misapprehension of magical thinking. Yeah. And that's because it's not, as Michelle said, that they don't know XML or whatever. It's that there isn't the basis of a literacy to allow, I'll give you an example. Um, this morning, dealing with some of my partners in country who didn't understand when we said we were building the phone app, that that didn't mean we were building an application to run on all phones for all time. Well, you know, as technologists, you normally wouldn't even ask that. You know, that wouldn't even occur to you. Well, I never promised all phones all time because that's just, right. you know, it's just <laughs> not, it never was a going concern that it would be all phones. Um, of course, I'm building it for those phones. But uh, so a question I have, and this actually even goes all, also to my sort of lack of, my more pessimistic feeling is that it's a very long conversation yes. um, in my experience. Yeah. It's a very long conversation. Start now to have it because your uh, community, wh wh however you define your community, needs to be talking to the technical community because those connections take time. And, and it's a skill to actually, uh, for the peace builders, the people that want to use the technology for their real world purpose, to get them to ask the right questions, right? They're not used, it, it, you have to be very goal oriented yeah. Exactly what do you need to do? Um, and it's not, you know, and we'll help you get there, um, but but teaching them to frame the question right so it can be translated into a technology solution is really an art. So I have um, I've left us not very long um, for do, are, is that two minutes overall? Do I get to do our last topic? We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, why don't we do um, one question um, around the topic of, of big data? How's that for an ending? Um, and uh, you know, this is obviously an enormous topic, um, but I'm gonna, I, I think this next slide actually kind of gets to um, the core of what we really wanted to talk about, which is who are we actually producing data for? Um, we have in our, our team uh, this Who's phrase, Superman data. data for Superman, <laughs> exactly. Um, data for Superman, the big decision makers here, you know, the Washington, the policy community. Are we producing data for them? Or are we actually, as peace builders, trying to produce and, and get data in the hands of the people on the ground who really are, as we heard earlier, doing the, the, the work day to day on um, conflict resolution? Um, so I guess with that, um, why don't we throw out one question and give everybody a chance, uh, kind of a, a go around, um, and then we'll end in, in three minutes. Um, but are you, you know who? How do we actually? Um, are we in a position to be able to really take all of this information that, that's feeding into us and turn it into very local, actionable uh, data and? If that's the case, do you have examples of, of how you're doing that? I think we heard a little bit from Rachel and, and Cece Niamani, uh, you know, in, in the election context. But um, do we have any thoughts, any closing thoughts on 
how we're tackling that monster challenge. Noel, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I'm gonna start off by saying no. <laughs> and the reason is we aren't the ones that can do it, right? It's, it's back to, to, the, to this picture here. And so, you know, so often we do data collection in a conflict zone. We go back and do the analysis and sometimes we'll give them the answer, right? But the, really the answer is for those guys because somehow Obama's gonna be able to fix this Boko Haram thing if he just has the right information. Well, no, it's really about people in the conflict zone changing, changing their expectations of the future. And how does that happen? And really what you're getting to is they need to own their own data profile. It, to be able to make big data granular enough for folks on the ground in a conflict zone to actually make sense out of it, they almost have to be able to do their own analysis, right? They, and how do you get, you know, people in DC don't really do data-driven stuff very well. So asking, you know, peace builders in conflict zones to do it, that's not an easy challenge. And, and it's, it's right where Michael said, I mean, our approach we're looking to do, we have this peace tech lab idea, but the idea is to find one of the best technologists, maybe two, from the conflict zone, we can't afford the best technologists here, but maybe we can in Khartoum, bring them to the lab as a Peace Tech Fellow, teach them about data analysis, data visualization, and how to use it, but just as critically, teach them about conflict analysis in mediation, in facilitation skills, and then have them go back to the conflict zone with a physical space, if possible, where they can bring in peace builders to a, you know, what we refer to as an open situation room where there's physical maps on the wall that they can list data at. And over a period of months, they're able to come back and start eventually starting to ask the questions that, that, that is gonna help them. And the answer probably isn't gonna be a fancy 3D moving diagram. It's gonna be an alert to a cell phone. Right, but you're not gonna get big data granular enough until the peace builders themselves are asking the questions that they need answers to, and you gear at that. And that's a long-term prospect, and that's a prospect where you need to have the capability in the country from a trusted source that they can actually start learning how to think from a data-driven mindset. Well, I, I would actually um, say yes and no. <laughs> um, and, and this goes to the other point that I made, that you really have to know what question you're answering before you can decide what data you're going to use and what tools. Um, and if you're answering a question on early warning and response and you're in country and you have this finite event that you're dealing with, um, big data is probably not the solution that you're going for there, um, unless you call uh, you know, getting SMSs from 65,000 people um, big data, which some may, some may not. I, I, I'd say that's very little. I'd say 50 tweets a second is a small amount of data. Um, so it's all relative to what you know. On the other hand, peace building is not just about the people on the ground. There's, big data is quite relevant when you're looking at post-conflict analysis. Yeah. And you have the ability to take the time with the data and to find the right tools. Um, and, and there still is a, a quite a bit of, um, you know, maybe Barack Obama's not gonna solve it, but there are lots of people working on the same problem in the government. Um, and they are spending vast amounts of time and money on infrastructure to handle big data. And, um, and on that, so we need it everywhere. On the other hand, the techniques aren't great. And you really, you know, it's not about, you can't ask the same questions with big data that you can with other data. And, and data science is not just about how do we handle big data, it's about knowing when to use one versus the other and, and how to handle that. And it's not just about scalability, it's if you actually need the scalability. Um, Michael, last one, and then I'm get, we're getting the proverbial. Okay. Well, the, the answer stage. to the question as it's posed in the slide is clearly no. It's a, it's a holy grail kind yeah. of um, question, and it's clearly the answer is no. Because as I understand the way you formed the question, Nancy, is how are those kids in that school pictured on the slide mm -hmm. gaining and empowered and being empowered by the data and the analysis of the data as opposed to just being the source of the data. Mm -hmm. If that's the question, our answer is we don't, we don't have an answer mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. um, Except I if would, you take disease in there, right? I mean, we, <laughs> health, I mean, there's a lot of data that goes into keeping populations educated and healthy and, uh, and, maybe, and a lot of daily right. data analysis. Maybe for, for development reasons and health yeah. reasons, but yeah. on, the, on the specific peace building. Yeah, I don't, we don't. The, and it's definitely a holy grail question. Um, it's a question that we are endeavoring to answer in our modest ways mm -hmm. uh, by new analytics that then push out to, say, the kids in that mm -hmm. school. 
But it, it's absolutely not it, a, a question that's been answered okay. yet. Rachel, take us home, and then we're, <laughs> okay. and then we're done. I was going to say, I actually think that <laughs> fundamentally the order that we have to think about these things in is often a bit off, because I think if there's an assumption that we should monitor and monitoring is good, I'm not sure that that's a right assumption. I think that what well, we have to go in and say, what change do we want to make? And if one of the steps that needs to be taken in order to create that change or influence a situation a certain way is that we need certain information that we can act on or that someone can act on, then we need to back up and design a monitoring platform that gets information and data to the people that um, need to take action or that need that information for a response. So I think who are we producing data for varies. In one case, it might be we want to influence international decision makers. In another case, it might be that we want to help local responders have better capacity to respond faster. But what we need to know first is what is our goal? And then back up and say, is monitoring even necessary? How much? Do we want to monitor using big data, medium data, small data, micro data, right? But I think it's really the order that we ask these questions and has to shift. It has to be goal first, and then do we monitor, and then how do we monitor? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for attending, and I want to thank the panelists very much so for, um, for their excellent input. <laughs> and with that, over to you, Christine. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, before I formally close the, the session for today, I want to ask you all for a favor, if I might, since you're captive in our auditorium. Uh, I'd like to ask you to help us be a better resource for you here at USIP. I think many of you know we do training and education courses online here in the field. Uh, we develop research, but papers, books, toolkits. We throw a peace tech lab. We're developing technological tools, so on and so forth. We're doing a lot of this with the intent to help all of you be more effective and all our partners in the, in the field be more effective. If we can do things that will help you, please let us know. If we're doing things that aren't that useful, please let us know that too or how they could be more useful because that's why we're here. Uh, please, a good way to do that is by getting engaged. So if you're not following us, uh, if you're not getting our regular emails, if you're not following us on Twitter, the USIP feed, but also you know all of our scholars you know, Noel's on Twitter, I'm on Twitter, Sharon, even Sharon's now on Twitter, you know, others. Uh, it's a good way for us to keep up with each other. Um, so please, uh, that, that's my uh, favor I'd like to ask all of you. Uh, but in closing the session today, let me just say I think it's been a terrific day. I hope you agree. We're very thankful to the Alliance for Peace Building and everybody uh, there uh, for their partnership here. I'm supposed to give you um, some requests uh, from AFP and USIP. One is to please fill out your survey because we'd like to do this even better next year. We can't do that if you don't have your feedback. Data. We want data. We want data. <laughs> it doesn't have to be big data. It's just <laughs> enough data for us to make the conference better. Um, so please fill out your survey. Um, it's low tech. It's very low tech. So even the techophobes can, uh, can deal with it. There's a cocktail reception at the Beacon Hotel at 6. That's very important news. Uh, but the last thing I need to do is thank some specific people who really helped make today possible. Melanie Greenberg and the whole team at AFP I already mentioned. Of course, our panelists right here. And then my own team, which I definitely don't want to forget to mention because I have to keep working with them. Um, and these are only a small subset, so I'll, I'll th thank everybody else collectively. Uh, Linwood Ham, Sharon Morris, Selena Kanoda, Jamie Schilling, Bill Vaughn, Matt Lolich, Stephen Blake, uh, Brian Hammond, the Porters, Adriana Sanchez, and Anna Velasquez at Seasons. Uh, I want to thank all of our team for the work they do every day, uh, but especially thanks to all of you who are helping us to promote our shared mission of preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflicts around the world. Thanks very much. Thank you.